Sevel, Bhagya Ye, Dafa greetings to everyone. Welcome to this panel discussion session titled Speak About Dafa Khala. This is the first in the series of four part panel discussion program, Dafa Calling, presented by US Embassy's Book Buzz program and collaboratively organized by QC Bookshop, Satori Center for the Arts, and Tonani Dafa Khala. I am Pushpa Palanchoki, an ethnomusicology postgraduate from the Department of Music, Kathmandu University. I will be moderating the two major, uh, the two hours long session. This session, Speak About Dafa Khala, will primarily revolve around two major themes concerning Dafa tradition. One, its rituals, and the other, its pedagogical aspects. Through our panelists, their personal observations and years of research, we will try to answer questions like, what was um, and is the relationship between rituals and pedagogy in Dafa tradition? How should the next generation of practitioners approach these rituals and the traditional system of pedagogy? What does the future hold for the next generation of practitioners considering the changing socioeconomic and political structures? Um, so, well, today with us for the session uh, are some distinguished researchers. All of them have dedicated a significant portion of their academic interest to Newar as well as other communal music traditions of Nepal. Many of us in the audience may already know them, uh, but before introducing our speakers, um, our panelists to make this evening session uh, not just meaningful, but dafaful, we will start uh, this session with a short dafa singing performance by Professor Richard Vidas. Uh, Professor Vidas, I welcome you and leave you the screen. Namaste, Josolopa, to everyone. Um, <clears throat> this is just a short uh, dafa song, Jaya Shashidhara, um, composed by King Pratap Malla of Kathmandu in the 17th century, and still performed by many Dafa groups in Bhaktapur. Um, I hope the uh, sound um, system across the many miles that separate us all uh, will uh, serve to, to convey something of this song. Are Jaya Shashi Dhara Vin Bhuti Kauri Adha Sange Pani Pati Jalabha Shila Shobhe Sange Are Dhabala Bapu Vibhuti Sole Pita Ange Oh, God. 
Thank you, Professor Vidas. Uh, what he just performed is a Dafa song, as he stated, uh, written by Pratap Malla. Uh, he's a seventh century king of Kathmandu. And the song is called Jaya Sasidara. Uh, we might hear uh, some more about the song um, in the maybe in between our discussion session itself during our conversations. Um, Professor Vidas here, he did his, um, he did his Dafa training under the gurus of Dattatre uh, Dafakhala from Bhaktapur, Ratna uh, Mala Lachimashu and Panchala Lachimashu. Um, Ganesh Bahadur Karbuza of Kyo Dafakhala was also his, uh, was also one of his gurus. Um, Professor Richard Vides uh, is also um, a Lalaki player. Uh, he learned his lala key, which is a larger key drum. Uh, key is a drum very primary to Dafa tradition. Uh, he learned the lala key. Issa? Just a little. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, he learned his uh, lala key. Uh, he gained his lala key training from uh, late Hariko Binda Ranjitkar Guru uh, from Yache tradition of Bhaktapur, who was also a faculty member at um, music department of KU. Um, Professor Vidas is an author of Dafa, Sacred Singing in a South Asian City, Music, Performance, and Meaning in Bhaktapur, Nepal. Uh, he is a musicologist and an ethnomusicologist and has recently released a third documentary on the tradition in collaboration with Soyas, University of London, and Department of Music at Mandu University. Uh, his contribution to the field of South Asian classical and devotional music is well recognized and uh, we are very, very, very honored that uh, Professor Vidas accepted our invitation and uh, we intend to gain new perspective on understanding the Dafa tradition itself and its sacred social and musical order um, in his presence today in this uh, panel discussion series. Um, introducing our another panelist, we are joined by Professor Shubhas Ram Prasapati. Um, he belongs to the Nevar community of Thimi from Bhaktapur. Uh, Professor Prasapati, when here in Nepal, was very engaged in writing about Nevar music and culture. He has contributed numerous Nepal Bhasa writings on uh, Nevar music. Besides his PhD from the University of Washington titled Traditional Folk Fusion and Confusion, Music and Chains in the Newar Communities of Nepal presents the history of the chains Newar music has gone through. Uh, he's an ethnomusicologist and a Newar music educator who is currently engaged in conducting Newar drum lessons for both Newar and non-Newar students in Seattle, USA. Uh, we shall gain an insider's insight on chains and continuity that Dafa music tradition in specific um, and Newar music in general has seen. Uh, we will also learn about his approaches to teaching local music in the global classrooms. Um, our another panelist is Professor Victoria Dalgel, uh, who goes by the name Tori. Uh, Professor Tori is an ethnomusicologist who grew up in Nepal, uh, though she moved to USA with her parents for her higher studies. Her research interests on gender, ethnicity, ritual, and applied ethnomusicology brought her back to Nepal. Uh, she dedicated her PhD from the University of California Riverside uh, to the music tradition of the Tharu people. Her PhD dissertation titled Freedom, Margins, and Music, Musical Discourses of Tharu Ethnicity in Nepal looks at music's role within Tharu development efforts on how ethnicity is gendered within female stage performances and examines how ethnicity, modernity, and Nepal's changing political landscapes affect the musical choices of Christian Tharus. Professor Tori will bring her insights from our vernacular music tradition, Sakya Payanach, of Tharu local music practitioners, who, like the Newar indigenous people, are adapting to the new uh, socio-political as well as economic environment. 
Uh, I welcome you all, our three panelists, for the session. And thank you very much once again for finding time and Jill to join us. Um, so I would like to start the session with a very um, common, uh, with a very general question directed to all of you. Uh, anyone of you can initiate the conversation based on your own observations and practices. Uh, is oral transmission replaceable? A very generic question. The question is interesting. Uh, and I think another question arises when we ask if the oral transmission can be replaceable. Why do we need to replace oral transmission? That is another question that raises together, I think. And oral transmission is still a very effective method and it is inseparable part when we talk about Newar music because oral transmission helps to keep the tradition of sharing and experiencing music. And, um, you know, it, is, it has been tradition for very long and it, it's still effective. It is still continued. Uh, but what uh, would be much effective, I think, would be how we can use various tools and technologies to aid the oral transmission. I think that might be uh, the way to go rather than looking for uh, replacing the oral transmission itself. Thank you, Professor um, Pasapati. I would, we would like to hear um, uh, the, hear the answer of the same question from our other panelists as well. Oh, I actually really liked Subhash's answer because the question when it comes to can we replace oral transmission, it kind of assumes that there's a, um, a specific divide between like oral and written, which there's not. Um, it kind of goes, it goes together. And I think you can look at that with any music tradition, even one that is technically written like Western art music. A lot of people still rely on their, their instructors and who they studied with to give them um, the authority that they need to be a musical interpreter. So, um, I mean, like Subhash said, it's not so much, you know, can we replace it, but what other tools can we use to kind of augment its efficacy? That being said too, when we're using these other tools, we shouldn't say that like we're replacing orality. It's more about augmenting it. Yes, I would think, uh, agree entirely with uh, um, both my colleagues. Uh, and, and I do agree that um, other technologies, including writing, can be, could be used to help um, maintain uh, basically oral transmission. It depends, though, rather whether you're thinking in terms of supporting existing groups which have their own customs and, and practice, um, or whether you're thinking of creating new groups which might operate in a different way from traditional groups. Um, but I think uh, that even for traditional existing groups, um, there are ways that, um, for example, recording could be used to, to help uh, students to, to learn. Um, and uh, writing, um, if only for the, the words of songs, um, uh, at the moment, um, uh, learners have to learn everything by heart, orally. Um, they don't all, as I understand it, they don't each individually have their own songbook to read from. Um, so at least uh, some written version of the song texts um, might be useful. And that, that brings up another problem, which is that the texts as given in the uh, songbooks uh, that each Dafa group has uh, it, it often is not completely comprehensible because uh, there are mistakes in the text that have crept in over the generations. Um, so I think uh, there is a need for some systematic study of the song texts um, to see it, whether by consulting older manuscripts um, a kind of uh, uh, more, uh, more, more meaningful text could be created so that the students would actually know 
what this means and I think that would also make it easier for them to learn and uh, more enjoyable uh, to learn. Uh, at, at present, they very often only have a sketchy idea what the song texts actually mean. Um, then, of course, there's the possibility of using writing to, to represent the uh, musical structure, the uh, melody and the rhythm. Um, I don't see that playing a very big role with uh, traditional groups, and it's perhaps not necessary in that context. But if you were starting a new group, then to have a notated uh, version uh, in whatever form of notation, that, of course, would be another issue. Um, but, but, but that might be a useful uh, aid uh, for a group that was not going to follow the more traditional pattern of pedagogy, where um, basically you're, you're, um, you're learning for um, several hours every evening for at least six months, um, uh, um, often considerably more. Uh, so that is a very time-consuming process to do everything completely orally. And I think uh, even for traditional groups, if there is some way of helping the process along so that it's not such a burden on individuals and on the community, um, then that, I, th I think that, that would be beneficial. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, so, well, adding to that, uh, um, uh, what our engagement with the uh, DAFA practitioners from a few of the communities has shown that uh, there is a strong desire um, both uh, among the guru gurus and uh, in the new coming practitioners that um, they need something to stand on, you know, to start uh, with the DAFA practice itself, uh, with the learning process itself. And uh, so given uh, that, um, and also given that uh, there are varied forms of practices within a single city uh, when it comes to DAFA practice, um, do we see a possibility for establishing a unitary DAFA music theory or a unitary DAFA music system? Here, I think the problem uh, is one of localization. Um, in Bhaktapur, um, until re recently anyway, um, every neighborhood had its own DAFA group, sometimes more than one DAFA group. Um, and um, e each group was, was uh, well, there seemed to be very little uh, mobility or contact between groups in different neighborhoods. Um, uh, and of course, the practice in different groups varies uh, in, in, in to some extent. Um, so to I mean, in my book, I tried to generalize as far as I could as to you know, what the underlying musical structures and practices are, but I'm only too well aware that they do vary. And I've no doubt that it, um, in other parts of the Kathmandu Valley, there, that there is even more variation. So, so that is one problem. Another problem is the um, attrition of knowledge um, Darfar singers themselves acknowledge that they don't know as much as their fathers and their grandfathers knew. They say this quite explicitly, um, and they see it as a, 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 a problem. Um, but on the other hand, um, we have to keep in mind the difference between what I call implicit and explicit knowledge. Um, if a singer can sing a song, then uh, he or she has an implicit knowledge of that song, even if they can't verbally explain anything about the song, can't tell you what the theory of the song is or what the structure of the song is or uh, how it works in words, but they know it because they can sing it. Um, and I think this is uh, still uh, largely true. Uh, for Dafa groups, they know how to sing uh, at least many of the songs uh, in their repertoire. Um, so there is a basis for um, 
extrapolating uh, some kind of underlying theoretical system, which is basically what I've tried to do in my book. Um, uh, for example, I found that uh, the uh, different groups uh, sing very similar uh, ragu melodies before each song. Um, they are not aware of this. They don't recognize the ragu melody of the next group in the next neighborhood. They don't recognize that it is in some sense the same as their own because there are too many small differences, small variations. But when you compare across a number of groups, you see a pattern emerging, which shows that uh, basically that there is a common core there. There is a common core of melody. And the same is true, of course, for songs. Um, so there is a, a degree of, of shared repertoire, um, which could be the model for a, a, a theory uh, and a, uh, of, of practice. So to that, I would like to add a question, uh, which uh, uh, Professor Prasapati might uh, uh, address. Um, so like uh, Professor Vidas addressed that uh, there is a shared uh, uh, degree of shared uh, repertoire among, uh, even in the Newar drum traditions itself. So since you are um, a Newar music educator and you have been teaching Newar drum repertoires, um, away there in Seattle as well. So how do you address these uh, uh, concepts of, you know, uh, variations in practices? And when you teach, uh, what is uh, the source um, that you teach from? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, when we generally uh, speak about new our music transmission, we generally um, speak more about the vertical transmission rather than the horizontal transmission. And what I mean by vertical transmission is uh, passing from one generation to another. For example, there are different DAFA groups or different music groups. They are have been transferred from one generation to another, but uh, we generally do not uh, speak or do not uh, uh, pay much attention to the horizontal transmission, how we can communicate or how we can learn from different groups and such. So that's one general problem that, you know, uh, I think, you know, we uh, might want to uh, address in upcoming days. And uh, in, in terms of learning and teaching music, <clears throat> so I grew up in Timi Vaktapur where I learned different newer musical drums, such, such as Dhimi, Dha, Pachma, Naki, and others. And in my training, when I these people, I generally, you know, follow the repertoire I learned from the group. But at the same time, since I've also experienced uh, with different music traditions from different parts of the valley, I have collected uh, different repertoires and also the playing techniques from different parts. And although I teach like one uh, particular uh, music tradition or uh, the repertoire from one particular place, I also at least try to give examples from different uh, places how uh, the same uh, piece is played uh, by people from different areas or different uh, groups from the same area. So that would uh, generally, you know, uh, help uh, students to learn about the variations and how the same thing uh, you know, can be done differently or how people have been doing the same thing differently. So that's, you know, um, one approach I follow. And uh, uh, even, you know, uh, for the things I uh, personally cannot play or I can teach, if I have recording or photos and anything material from uh, different groups, uh, I try to uh, uh, present those uh, to the students as well. Professor Tori, uh, I believe it is uh, like the Subhas uh, sir just stated, uh, it is seem um, uh, the approach of transmission in the Thara music itself is similar, like he stated, the, um, um, the transmission happening from uh, one generation to the other. So um, drawing from your research with the oral epic uh, music performance, Sakya 
practice uh, among Tharu women. Uh, what are the new modes of pedagogy that the practitioners are adapting to? And how is the music tradition and uh, the practitioners are benefiting from these new modes of uh, pedagogy? To give some context for this tradition, since people might not be as familiar with it. Um, so the Sakyapaya Nats is performed annually during uh, Dasai, which is called Dasya in Taru communities. And it takes about a month to perform. Um, it is an epic, uh, talks about the story of the god Krishna. Uh, but this is a tradition that's done in each Taru village um, and it's primarily performed by young unmarried women. Um, usually it's not compulsory to, um, to participate. Uh, girls do it as they, they want to, but it is a community thing. So if the village itself has a strong tradition, then all your friends are participating. So you wanna go participate as well. Within that, there's usually two song leaders who will learn this song orally from a Guruama in the village. And again, this is where it's not like someone else chose this Guruama. It's more like she was most likely a song leader in her own village, like her natal village. And so when she married into the village, people just recognized that she knew this, this epic and was an authority on it. And so the girls then started learning from her. Um, those singers will then, so the two song leaders will then actually teach the song in performance um, each night to the other girls in attendance. So there is that kind of um, hierarchical uh, transmission, but then there's also kind of a horizontal transmission where it's peer to peer, um, not so much just um, from the guru to the, 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 um, the students. Uh, within that, yes, it is oral, but a lot of girls now, you know, they go to school, they have things like cell phones, and so a lot of them have actually started transcribing the song so that they can uh, better put it in their short-term memory. And so, yes, they will learn it in the evening from the, their guru, but then they'll transcribe those lyrics, <clears throat> they'll refer to those lyrics during the, the song when they perform it. Um, and then they'll also have their cell phone recordings that they'll, they'll learn um, and use that to memorize the song as well. And so you are having a lot of just like kind of personal notebooks that are um, popping up. Not only that, a lot of villages kind of like, um, like Richard said, uh, there's this kind of um, understanding that, you know, we don't know as much as our, our forefathers do. And so a lot of villages have actually started transcribing their own village's tradition of that song. So a lot of villages do have something where someone from the village sat with the Gudurama and just transcribed it. Um, and then the girls like learn from that. Um, and that was actually one of the villages that I visited. They didn't have a Gudurama, but they learned the song from the, the transcription that they had. Um, so you do have these other ways of learning and again, kind of technologies, if you want to call them incorporated into that transmission process. And as far as what I saw, um, it was actually really good because the girls were able to kind of take ownership of, um, of the song and of learning it. Of course, like some people, especially a lot of your um, women weren't so so keen on it and a lot of it I think came from not quite understanding not being knowing how to read and write themselves not being um not being familiar with that technology and seeing how um how it could actually like help the girls learn this song uh, but then there were other um teachers who were much more comfortable with the girls using that technology to learn it so um, you do have these new technologies that people are, are using. Um, but again, that's just this is a different example or an example from another um, tradition, slightly different from um, the tradition we're talking about here. Have you still come about uh, using the technologies in the, um, and approaching the pedagogy in different way? Um, uh, before that, um, now let's just switch the conversation a bit and um, come to the rituals uh, of the Dafa. Uh, so I would like to um, ask Professor Vides, uh, from your experience, what is, uh, uh, what is uh, there um, about the rituals of the Dafa and how they are connected to the 
uh, traditional means of uh, pedagogy? Yes, this is a very interesting question. Um, <clears throat> uh, the learning process in multiple DAFA groups is a very highly ritualized one. Um, and this, I'm sure, um, has to do with the uh, what's considered to be the esoteric power of knowledge, uh, and that that uh, includes musical knowledge. Music is is seen as a very powerful form of knowledge. So, um, training in for any musical um, skill, whether it's uh, singing dafa or playing tine drum or or any other musical uh, traditional musical activity um, uh, begins and ends with rituals and uh, in dafa uh, it, it has to end with the pirane puja which is an initiation to nasidio um, but there are other uh, less elaborate rituals uh, at the start of the process when the the, the class begins and there may be um, intermediary rituals at various points along the way uh, for example for uh, when you when you come to learn a particular tal um, or um, when you uh, start to learn how to sing with instruments uh, there may need to be additional rituals at, at those points and all the way along um, the process is supposed to be secret nobody is supposed to be in the room um, except the teacher and um, the, uh, the, the students um, so I have never been present at a, in a teaching uh, session I can only say what I've been told uh, about it but um, I'm sure that it, it, this, this um, sense of the um, power of musical knowledge is at the heart of it. And this is also something of a problem uh, because it means that uh, it, uh, uh, incomplete knowledge is dangerous, dangerous for the individual. Um, so once you start to learn, you have to finish the course. You're not allowed to drop out, or at least your uh, strenuous efforts are, are, are made to, to ensure that you don't drop out. The teaching, therefore, has to carry on for as long as it takes for possibly quite a large group of um, mostly quite young boys to learn the songs. Um, and the Pirani Puja can't happen until they have all mastered the re required number of songs. So different groups have different expectations as to how many songs uh, you have to learn. But it's all to do with this idea that if you, if you have some incomplete knowledge in, in your mind, this ultimately will be very bad for your mental health. Um, so... Um, the the process with its attendant rituals uh, is it takes a lot of time take, uh, uh, takes um, a lot of money it's very costly uh, and the community somehow has to raise the funds for all the rituals especially the pirane puja which is followed by a big feast for everybody in the local community um, so um, Gurus do not lightly undertake uh, to teach. In most groups traditionally they would teach about once every 10 or 12 years. And so they gather a big group of, of young people from the neighborhood um, and teach them all at once um, with a big feast at the end of the process. Um, but now gurus uh, are very hesitant even to start uh, to teach because they're afraid that uh, nowadays the students won't last the course. Um, they may be reluctant even to start learning, but then if they do start, they may drop out um, because there are so many other pressures on people now. Um, uh, parents um, are, are very, of course, very um, keen that their uh, children should do well in their school exams. That is the most important thing. Um, in the local communities now rather than learning DAFA. Um, so 
uh, for this reason, the uh, the gurus um, are uh, often reluctant to start, even when they feel it's time that they should start teaching. Um, it doesn't necessarily happen anymore. Yes, I think that that is one of the prime um, um, prime issue that uh, has come up uh, regarding the Alpha tradition um, in present day context. Um, going back to the um, ideas of restrictions uh, in relation to acquiring esoteric knowledge. Um, so it seems that there is a strong uh, desire uh, even among the community practitioners themselves and especially um, there is this desire with the culture uh, advocates and uh, uh, even in in our opening ceremony this morning, uh, we were uh, joined by uh, one of the uh, representatives from the Kirtipur municipality, and uh, uh, he showed a strong desire in actually incorporating the Dafa music um, tradition into uh, Dafa music into uh, the local school curriculum. Um, so, given that, uh, I would direct this question to uh, Professor Prasavati. Um, given that, uh, where can music educators? Um, um, who themselves can be practitioners or cannot uh, uh, or can be an outsider uh, how can they where and how can they start uh, you know um, into actually creating a curriculum if uh, if that's what uh, the next step is as uh, professor Vides has also mentioned uh, the DAFA tradition is especially the uh, learning process and apprenticeship is very costly and highly ritualized uh, and um, there are you know, a lot of things in DAFA, for instance, text and music, uh, which, you know, uh, needs to be, I think, uh, reviewed at this time when, you know, we are talking about including it in formal education. For instance, uh, let's just talk about the text, the DAFA songs or text. Uh, in many cases, that uh, very few people understand the meaning of the song and the script in which the songs are written, uh, because uh, Dafa songs uh, generally include different languages and um, can include multiple languages in one song. And even if we look at the song manuscripts, uh, they are written like prose, not like poetry. And sometimes it's hard to know which segments uh, are, you know, there and what are the segments. And also that, you know, there are a lot of errors while copying in terms of language and meaning because it has been copied uh, uh, like generation to generation. Uh, and also there are like a lot of uh, changes in dialects in the text scripts. So uh, the one thing, you know, where we might want to start is collect uh, those manuscripts and uh, edit the manuscripts and try to publish the correct versions as far as we know. So that might be the one uh, place, you know, where we might want to start. Uh, and in this regard, uh, for instance, you know, a, a recent book by Trita Thamanadar, uh, that can be like one good example, you know, he has done a very, you know, uh, nice job of compiling those. So uh, that can be one thing where we want to start when uh, we are talking about including this in school curriculum and such. And other thing uh, might be uh, in music component, for example, <laughs> when we talk about raga and tada. So in that part, there's uh, no explicit pitch system and uh, pitch could change, you know, when uh, certain words are repeated or um, and performance to performance or singers to singers in the same performance. So um, another thing, you know, we might want to uh, explore is uh, how we can, you know, uh, bring or make, you know, some sort of standard form. Uh, when DAFA was started uh, in medieval period, probably it was not started uh, this way. Uh, we lost you know, perhaps something in the middle. So um, uh, if, you know, we want to include in school curriculum or if we want to standardize, so we might want to think like 
can we bring this back? Can we theorize this? Or can we document uh, in some way? Um, so, you know, these are the few things I mean, I think, you know, we should be starting with. And again, so documentation is not everything uh, and the transcriptions are not the true representation of the orally produced music, but at least it uh, uh, gives a snapshot of what we have in this period of time. And uh, we can use that as a reference for learning and teaching. Uh, so, yeah, I think, you know, these are a few things. And of course, you know, there are uh, the things, you know, we might want to explore such as tools and technologies, how we can use various technologies in teaching and learning. So when we uh, say tools and technologies that we can add to uh, the Dafa pedagogy or to any other traditional forms of music like Dafa itself or the communal form of music like Dafa itself, um, are there some specific tools that you've been using? Um, I would also like to forward this question to Tori, ma'am. If she has uh, seen other tools that are being used uh, in the community that she was studying, um, any any examples that you would like to share so that uh, um, you know um, the music educators out there who are really willing to work uh, um, work in this direction get some hints from from you? Yeah. When I learned uh, key, uh, when I was learning Pachma uh, and back in the days, that has been a little while ago. So the, the guru did not allow me to write anything, any um, in a drum syllables or anything at all. And when I learned, I had to learn everything by heart. And I used to go home and you know try to write everything I learned on that day. And one day the guru saw that uh, copy, you know. Uh, you know, where I was writing those and I was <laughs> very scold and I had to tear down that notebook. And, you know, things have changed since then. Uh, and uh, uh, the drummers, you know, who are the learners, uh, they do transcribe in some way what they learn or what uh, teachers teach in case of the teachers. And in terms of tools and technology, at least, you know, if we can use few like a you know, notating system just for a learning purpose or at least for, you know, adding the memory rather than everything just keeping in mind, like learning by heart and just memorizing it, that can be helpful. For example, audio video tools and, uh, for example, if we can just uh, audio tape or videotape um, certain repertoire and we can still, you know, listen to that and, you know, uh, maybe distribute among the students and other groups so that uh, the teachers doesn't need to repeat that over and over or um, the students have at least some difference. They can go back, you know, if they want to or when they want to. Uh, so anything, you know, what is available right now from like audio video tools or some transcribing tools, uh, I think those will be helpful. So, well, Professor Toi, you also stated that uh, um, the new practitioners in uh, the Sakipaya dance uh, uh, practice were actually using uh, their uh, writing. They were notating um, the song text itself. Um, so, you also added that uh, peer review was one of their um, key tools. Um, would you like to add something on that? I mean, how much is peer review important in um, music learning and uh, how, uh, how can we promote peer learning, uh, peer reviews uh, in learning and uh, uh, how can that aid uh, to, uh, you know, ideas of, uh, um, aid to flourishing ideas of inclusivity and uh, participation and tolerance in uh, communal music practices in um, society, uh, in multicultural society like that of Nepal, where um, we have various, you know, like uh, issues in relation to politics, in relation to um, uh, crisis that ha globalization has brought to the local communities. So how important peer reviewing is um, in learning settings 
uh, of uh, of the kind that we are talking about? I think one thing to recognize, and again, this is something that um, it differs person to person, but when these, um, if we want to call them new technologies, such as writing or recording, are included in that transmission process, I think something that um, has to be conveyed is that they're not replacing the guru. Um, it's not like I'm going to write these things down and then I'm just going to refer to the recordings and the transcription I made and I'm no longer going to go back to my guru and ask for their advice or continue to learn from them. Um, and I think that's where a lot of um, these women were really successful in incorporating these because um, the, the guru ama didn't feel like she was being excluded because she was still, they still came to her each evening for their lesson. Um, oftentimes in performance, it wasn't uncommon for the song leader to consult with the guru ama or even with the guru ama to kind of interject and give direction as far as like how the girls were either dancing or singing. So um, in these cases, those things, those technologies were more tools to help them put it in their short term memory. Um, it didn't mean that they were replacing their their guru ama. So I think that's one thing where um, some um, some teachers might just feel threatened with these new technologies. So a lot of it is just that communication that no, this is not replacing you. Um, this is just a new way for for me to learn. And a lot of the women understood that because they're like, well, the girls go to school now. They have they use these technologies to learn. So it makes sense that they want to transcribe them. Um, so hopefully that did that answer your question or was there another part of your question that I missed? Uh, th actually, thank you for highlighting that. And uh, I was primarily directing to uh, how important do you think peer reviewing is? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So in that case, um, again, usually you just have the song leaders who are learning from the, the Guru Ama. It doesn't mean that other girls couldn't attend those um, teaching sessions. They were welcome to. Uh, but for a lot of girls, it just depended on how much they were prioritizing learning themselves or if they just wanted to participate in the dance just to, to hang out with their friends and that sort of thing. Um, so when it came to the performances themselves. So the song, it's, you know, several, several lines and those lines are actually repeated between two groups of girls. So like one group will start, the other group will repeat, and they might repeat that line several times. And so it's just in performance, these girls are learning, learning the song. And so if you're someone who just wants to go and participate because all your friends are there, you're going to learn the song just by repetition by hearing it from the women on either side of you, um, that sort of thing. And um, some of the women that I uh, talked to, um, specifically the, um, the wife of the family that I, that I lived with, she herself was not a song leader, but she could still sing a number of the lines um, when, when she wanted to. And there were a couple of times where like I would bring recordings that I made in other villages and we'd listen to them together. And she would be like, oh, well, that's a little different than what how we perform it in our village. Let me let me just sing that for you. And she'd sing the line. So this was like years after she had, you know, participated and she hadn't, you know, herself been a song leader. But she still remembered those those lines just from participating um, for however many years she did before she before she got married. So there is still like peer to peer can be very effective. And I think that is a role. It's not just that, um, you know, from the guru to the student, but actually learning from other students, too, can be very effective. So, well, going back to what you mentioned about uh, uh, the transcribing of uh, music or using these new technologies isn't uh, replacing uh, the guru. Um, so. But, uh, like you also stated that there is a sort of fear among uh, the elderly generation that maybe they are being replaced in in a certain manner. Um, so given that, uh, and when we are saying that uh, Dafa practice itself might now move to a new set of practitioners and uh, audience itself, uh, how can the local communities keep becoming part of, uh, of the tradition that is um, 
that is moving from local to global? And uh, how should the local community approach uh, the transmission and dissemination, uh, considering the, you know, the booming digital world and uh, global connectivity? Uh, I would uh, um, forward this question to Professor Vides. Oh gosh, that's uh, that's a very tricky one. I'm not sure how to uh, how to, how to uh, how to respond to that because um, uh, it, in in many uh, neighbourhoods of Bhaktapur, um it's not simply a question of uh, voluntary membership of of uh, the Dafa. Uh, in, in some neighbourhoods, it's actually. Uh, required of every uh, family living in that neighborhood uh, if they have a, a a son or more than one son uh, they are required to to send them to, to by by tradition to to learn dafa and it's a part of um, the process of enculturation for the for the children um, to to learn how to grow up into being adult members of the community they do it well, they used to do it through membership of the Dafa group, uh, and I've no doubt other music groups also uh, worked in the same way, had a similar social function um, of, of helping to to uh, socialise um, the younger members of the community into into adult participation. Um, so I really don't know how you translate that onto a, a, a onto a bigger um, scenario. Um, it seems to me that everything changes if um, if you um, uh, put Dafa on a on a non-local platform on a on a wider platform. Uh, then it seems to me well at least membership uh, it becomes voluntary. It must be. Um, it, it must be something people do because they want to in the way that uh, Tori Dalzell has described for her uh, tradition. Um, so, um, yeah, beyond that, I, I'm really not sure. Um, I mean, it, 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 I've often thought it would be perfectly possible to, to set up a new DAFA group, um, maybe based in an institution like a university or something like that, and run it according to new uh, practices uh, involving new different teaching techniques, different technologies, writing, notation, and, and so on, if, if, if one wanted to. But then you'd have to consider, well, what is the function of that, that group? If it's clearly not the, uh, the normal function of a DAFA, group in its um, close-knit neighborhood society. It is really interesting to observe that uh, new um, uh, DAFA is getting into new uh, settings. And uh, so here we have started seeing that DAFA groups are actually performing on stages uh, beyond uh, their uh, traditional ritualistic spheres. And uh, so I would like to repeat this question again, and uh, uh, would like to forward this question to um, Professor Prasapati. Uh, what is your viewpoint on this? I mean, if um, this particular communal music tradition is to move to a new set of practitioners and to a new set of audience, um, how can the local communities, you know, keep becoming the part of this this tradition? Dafa tradition, you know, if uh, we were to, you know, um, expand this to the new audience and uh, develop the new platform, so uh, that would be a good way to promote uh, uh, the Dafa music, uh, but it does not necessarily guarantee the continuation of the tradition as it is uh, carried uh, until now. Uh, but it definitely helps to promote and raise the awareness about Dafa music. And possibly, you know, those uh, people or the performers will also continue the tradition in the traditional setting. And uh, uh, some platforms, you know, like even like discussion platform like this uh, is very essential at this uh, point of time to uh, uh, discuss about what might be the possibilities, what we could do to preserve the traditions. 
and such. So uh, yeah, uh, the performers uh, can, you know, or they will get opportunity to perform DAFA in different stages. Uh, and that will also encourage other uh, general public to be part of DAFA groups or DAFA team or learn DAFA. So uh, the, these new platforms are very essential. And uh, in the same note, I would like to bring one example from um, 2017, 2016 and 17, when uh, Nepal Mindal Television organized a DAFA festival that lasted for six months. And there were some 120 DAFA groups presented DAFA in that festival. And uh, that's the indication that there are at least that many traditional group which can be revived even if they are not performing regularly. Uh, and uh, so I think there's a separate session discussing on the creating of new platforms and I hope, you know, uh, definitely there will be more ideas uh, in uh, that session of uh, that for ca calling uh, this series. Thank you for addressing that. Uh, we we do have uh, more sessions in Dafa Calling panel series, uh, and uh, we uh, we do desire to talk more on this uh, issue because as we see that Dafa is really moving towards a new set of practitioners, and uh, and there is this strong desire to expand the Dafa itself. Um, so now coming back to uh, talking about uh, Dafa's uh, rituals and pedagogy once again. Um, um, so I would like to uh, direct this to Professor Richard Vides. Um, so I've, I've heard you saying in one of the uh, one of your um, talks that music is a knowledge of a system uh, which is usually transmitted through practice rather than language or writing, and uh, uh, when we are saying that uh, there is a strong opinion uh, building among the Nepali music uh, ex advocates uh, plus Newar music advocates themselves that uh, we need music education system that incorporates Nepali traditional music. Uh, however, at the same time, there is a tendency of seeking a standard models, um, not knowing what or how that should appear. Uh, so given that, uh, you know, is, is there a way that even the rituals themselves that uh, has been part of the community for such a long time can be uh, part of the um, new music curriculums in some way? Um, have you seen any of the, any of similar examples in South Asia, anywhere else? Um, not really. Um, I can't, uh, I can't just think of a, Oh, well, example. There must be many <coughs> cases where where traditional music uh, is, is is taught in a ritualized way. Um, um, but I I, I I agree that um, it would be wonderful uh, if the education system uh, in Nepal were to include more in the way of. Uh, uh, Nepali traditional uh, music genres, um, and I know that uh, some people have been working uh, towards that. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Indira Nachimotsu uh, uh, has been teaching drumming traditions in schools, um, and um, clearly that's not going to be quite the same um, process. Or, or, or quite the same experience for the children as as being part of, a, 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 say, a dime group in Bhaktapur and, uh, and processing uh, through the streets at festival time and, and uh, uh, participating in, the, in various um, religious ceremonies and rituals and so on. Um, but at least it, it's a start. Um, so I think one needn't worry too much about in that context, importing or having to take on board the whole uh, paraphernalia of ritual and, and so on, um, it's more important perhaps to, to give 
give people a sense of what this music is like, um, and perhaps to know that there are also uh, rituals that go with this, and, um, but um, um, I, I would assume that the objective is for, for children to grow up with a sense of the variety of different musical traditions uh, that, that there are, the richness of, of, of uh, musical tradition in Nepal, um, rather than being embedded in, in one single genre. That could come later at, say, maybe a university level. Um, uh, there might be more, more scope for, for a more in-depth exposure to uh, Dafa as such. Um, I would like to direct one question to Professor Tori. Um, so given that uh, um, the community attach uh, so much value to um, their traditions and uh, the music tradition that they practice, uh, what is most in building the agency of the community itself uh, uh, when we talk about, uh, uh, you know, um, disseminating their knowledge and uh, what how how we can build the agency of the community people itself so kind of going off of some of the things that both um richard and subash have already said uh, i think the key here is again not forgetting the community and the practitioners it's not just a matter of you know kind of taking these pieces and either putting them in a university setting or you know putting them on stage but making sure that those practitioners are really involved in the decision-making process as far as what they want this to, to look like. Um, and that's actually something that's been a bit of a challenge in the, the Taro community, especially when it comes to the Sakyapaya in particular, because it is a ritual dance. Um, it is something that's very specific to the Dangara Taro communities. It's not found in other Taro uh, subgroups. And so a lot of people kind of see this as very distinctive. And so when you have competitions or you have folk festivals or there's other kinds of things, there actually has been pressure both within the community as well as in, um, from communities outside of the Tauru community to put this uh, ritual dance on stage to kind of showcase it as like part of like Tauru or uh, like Dangara Tauru culture, right? So kind of representative of that. And a lot of communities, there's been some resistance because they're like, well, it's, it is a ritual dance. There are rituals that we have to do at different points of time during this dance um, in order to ensure the safety of the dancers, in order to ensure that um, the well being of the community. And if you do it outside of its season and without those rituals, then you're opening yourself up to danger. And so, um, there's a couple communities that, you know, they've decided, no, we're not going to perform this on stages. And then there's other communities who have been a little more creative and mm -hmm. been like, well, we can go ahead and do, we can perform the Sakya only, sorry, the Paya only, which is the dance. We'll only perform Paya, we won't perform the Sakya because Paya is a little more like, that's the kind of um, dances that happen in breaks during this longer, um, longer song. And so we can perform that. And because it's a dance, it doesn't involve language either. So people who don't speak Taru, they'll be it'll um, be a little more attractive to them. Other communities have decided we'll go ahead and do a little bit of Sakya, but if we're going to do that, we're going to make sure we do these rituals in our village first before sending our troop to go perform on stage, right? And I think a lot of it comes from um, like the organizers of these different festivals or, or performances where they just have to be willing to be okay with whatever um, decision the community makes. So if they decide that, you know, we don't wanna perform this on stage, then be okay with that. Um, there's lots of other options for, for, you know, genres or things to perform that would represent the Taru community. Um, and so there's, it's not like the Sakyapaya is the only, only thing there. Um, so yeah, it's just that involvement of the community and making sure that they feel like they're a part of this, um, that they're not you know, being forced to kind of um, showcase it as just like an object where, again, they're, they're not in, invested in that. 
And so to add off of that, because both um, Richard and Subhash kind of talked about, you know, what should these things kind of look like in a university setting? I think some of that just kind of goes along with like where the community is at at the time. Um, because to give an example, and I think this is a, a question for ethnomusicologists because we do usually work in university settings and especially uh, with the history of ethnomusicology and musicology in the West, um, there is kind of this idea that you're a music department, you're supposed to have ensembles. So if you're an ethnomusicologist, we need to have ensembles for, of other traditions from other parts of the world, kind of next to our orchestras and choirs and those kinds of things. Um, but then like, how do you effectively do that in the university setting and who is this actually serving? Um, with one of the ensembles that I've been a part of for a long time at the University of California, Riverside is the Andean Ensemble. So we play music from um, South America, specifically the, the Andes region. Most of the repertoire we play is from Peru, uh, just because that's where the ensemble instructor did his research. But what's been interesting about being part of this ensemble, especially in Southern California, and is to see who's attracted to actually being part of the ensemble, because there's no prerequisites. You don't have to be, be a, a quote unquote musician or have any kind of musical training to join uh, because the repertoire and the traditions that he emphasizes are much more the participatory community-based ones. And it's been interesting to see that a lot of the students who are attracted um, are like second or third generation uh, removed from Peru or from um, the Andean region. So they kind of feel like this is part of my, my heritage or this is like part of something that is in my family, but because I live in the United States, because I'm a couple generations removed, like I don't immediately have access to these. And so for a lot of these students, joining the ensemble is one way to kind of reconnect with some aspect of, of their heritage. Um, and the way that my ensemble director does the ensemble too, he makes sure that he does things with um, Peruvian communities in Southern California. So we've had practitioners come to our ensemble to um, music and dance is really connected in a lot of the traditions that we do. And so we've had a dance instructor come and, um, you know, teach us these dances, or we've basically been like the, the band accompanying his dancers for um, some of our performances. And then we've also returned the favor where they have a performance and they specifically need a Siku um, ensemble. They've called us to come and be their Siku ensemble as well. So there's still that community involvement. There's still people who feel like they have some kind of connection to this. So it's still serving that, that purpose. Uh, In addition to, you know, introducing it to people like me who not from Peru, don't really know about this tradition, but definitely am enriched all the more for knowing about it. We were talking about how uh, Duffer music can be brought into the university setting. Um, mm -hmm. By, by let's say, ethnomusic lazas themselves. But if the community itself is willing to bring in uh, music students or scholars into the khala and teaching them their knowledge, then um, where does the challenge lie? And uh, what things should they address first to welcome them? There can be uh, both challenges and opportunities when uh, bringing in uh, outsiders to the team. Uh, one uh, challenge might be um, like what their role will be in the team, right? For instance, if there is an established uh, Dafa Kala or Dafa team, and which also has, uh, let's say, uh, land property or other properties, uh, which uh, from which you know they continue the tradition, and in such uh, settings, if someone from outside, not necessarily from uh, outside of Nepal, but even in the same community, uh, what will be his role in the team? Uh, can the community, the Dafakala, uh, welcome him as the same Guthi members as others? So that's like one thing you know uh, that might come as a challenge 
But uh, for the learning purpose, uh, if we are only talking about the learning purpose, not as including as a Guthi member, uh, it might be easier uh, because learning, anyone can generally learn uh, from the team and share the knowledge, right? Uh, so that's you know one thing um, uh, I can think of now. And other things might be if, uh, a person is from different community and different, you know, if they speak different language, different dialects, and those sort of things are like the general, you know, uh, uh, issues, you know, that uh, might uh, be there. Uh, otherwise, I think, uh, uh, as you know, uh, Professor Willis also mentioned earlier that if we form like a very new team rather than bringing in uh, people from one team and you know uh, bringing to the already established uh, Dafakala, that might be challenging. But if we uh, form a new team, completely new team, uh, uh, that might be easier in the sense that uh, uh, how to run the team and how do we uh, uh, practice in that team and you know, how to organize the events and such. And uh, in this regard, so I have seen uh, different um, uh, music groups in Kathmandu. Uh, those are not the Dafa Kala, but those are the Dhimi groups, which are very newly established by the members of the community. They are from uh, different castes. They are, they are from different regions uh, within the Kathmandu. And, and uh, they are also from, um, they, they include both uh, male and female um, musicians. So uh, it is easier for them to form such group, which <clears throat> would have been uh, difficult if you know, they had gone to already establish a traditional music group. Uh, thank you, Professor Prasabhati. So, well, uh, like you stated, we do have seen that uh, Dafa itself has started, um, Dafa also has started seeing um, uh, um, sort of uh, um, incoming of new members of, um, let's say, uh, belonging to another gender, belonging to another caste. Um, so like you stated, yes, that uh, those challenges could be there and, um, and those challenges are there in the hands of the local practitioners themselves to address. So we have received um, quite a good number of questions. So I'll read uh, one question from uh, one of our audience. This is uh, from Ishan Gimiri. Um, he asks, going forward with many technologies we have at hand now, should the focus be more on the intergenerational transmission of culture, however it may be, or on the mediums of transmission, either oral or recorded or et cetera? He hasn't mentioned this, uh, directed this to anybody. So um, any one of us can respond to this question. I think I can answer that a little bit. So our focus should be intergenerational um, you know, for sure, because you know we want to continue this uh, tradition. And at the same time, um, to share the knowledge among uh, the different DAFA groups and uh, different localities, we also need to uh, um, work on uh, the horizontal transmission uh, so that you know uh, we can uh, learn from each other. So that is that doesn't seem to be much happening now, but we should also be focusing on that. We have some more questions from Isan Gimiri. Um, if, if you're here, uh, you can maybe unmute your mic and uh, make yourself visible and um, ask your questions, directing it to our speakers. Uh, thank you, Puspa. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, so just for my background, I teach uh, anthropology and social uh, you know, South Asian civilizations to the undergrad at uh, the Kathmandu University Department of Music. And um, sorry, my questions was not directed to a particular person or uh, in the panel. And my first question was more on the first thing that we 
uh, had been discussing about whether whether um, whether the oral transmissions was is it irreplaceable or should that be continued or, or and things like that. So um, thank you, Subhasi, for answering on that. So on my second question, I think uh, I was there in the opening ceremony today with, uh, when Ramesh C from Kirtipur. Yeah, but municipality talked about in, including these curriculums in local contexts and local uh, schools and everything. Uh, but, and I do understand from a very quite a local perspective, and that encourages people from the community and also promotes the music and everything. Uh, but what I do wonder is in a multi-ethnic society such as ours with more than 100, 115 different indigenous groups with their own cultural backgrounds and everything, uh, can such curriculums go beyond the local? Uh, can it be taken to a national level? And uh, what might be the competitions that comes to uh, other ethnic cultural traditions come from? forward like uh, do you see uh, like would there be any contentious or conflicts uh, of interest in the locality as the as the cities and the places are going more urban uh, and how do we manage that uh, how do we prioritize what should be focused and put into the schools and the education systems so that is basically my question anyone or anyone in the floor it just seems obvious to me that the priority should be given to local traditions uh, wherever uh, this kind of education is being developed um, they surely the local traditions have to take priority but perhaps not in an exclusive way um, um, and but then again um, availability of expertise is the, the other limiting factor isn't it um, you're not going to have anybody who's who's uh, capable of teaching dafa in, in every part of nepal that, that is uh, also obvious um but even where uh, dafa might be the uh, prioritized uh, genre th there is it, it, it's clearly a very attractive genre for, uh, in, in in this way that uh, actually singing is not technically very demanding. Uh, it, it is, I think, well within most people's um, capacity to join in with the singing. It is a participatory genre. And um, a, a, as with the um, uh, singing that Victoria was describing, you, you, you could learn it just by participating. You have this antiphonal side to side repetition, lots of repetition of every verse. Um, so that in itself uh, can be a, a, a learning, um, a way of learning. Um, but at the same time, there is the all important accompaniment on the king, Lala King, as we call it in Bhaktapur. And that is a very sophisticated uh, uh, genre of drumming, um, uh, according to my friend Gert Wigner, who, who has learned all the drumming traditions mm. in Bhaktapur. Um, Lala King is the most difficult. And for that, you have to have an expert. Um, or, or if it's going to be taught in an institution, it will take longer. Um, so there's, that's another limitation, perhaps. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I think my last question that I put forward uh, before I give the floor, um, before uh, someone, um, I let you all with other people's question is, uh, uh, Often, so with my background in anthropology and trying to understand different culture and indigenous peoples and minority people in any society, I've often seen that when there has been a state involvement or a government involvement in it, there are powerful powerful assimilative factors that do come in because uh, the government does not necessarily only prioritize on the local but it is also looking at national thing and so uh, i do always wonder uh, is it always is it a good idea to all 
And of course, in the past, there has been patronage. It has been always it has always been from the king's courtiers or in uh, in other places from where all these traditions have do have come about. But in the modern world and in the globalized worlds, where there are so many traditions and so many things coming about, it's a com complex situation right now. Uh, I do really wonder is how. How, I don't. It's like I'm not really comfortable. Like I don't. I don't feel comfortable about how how much the government or the local community, the local government, you know, gets engaged in all these kinds of traditions that have been upheld by the community, uh, which tend to be mostly apolitical. And it, as you say, it comes from religious rituals, and there are other traditions coming from coming from it. So I do really wonder: is it actually necessary to bring in the government in such sense because i do see the merits of it also but i'm always afraid that there are some assimilative factors that are going to just i don't know but just dismantle this heritage and conservation and this continuity of the tradition that has been going on for centuries so my question is more towards that i guess with the government's involvement and assimilation and acculturation and all of this so with uh, this new change in curricular um, and uh, including local curriculum in local area. So um, for instance, you know, Bhaktapur has already implemented its local curriculum in schools in Bhaktapur. Similarly, uh, Kathmandu has developed its local curriculum, which is being um, implemented from the next uh, school year. And similarly, Kirtpur and other municipalities are also working uh, to develop their uh, one curriculum, one local curriculum in uh, schools. And uh, uh, when we talk about in, uh, including this uh, culture or music or dances in the local curriculum, it makes more sense to include uh, the local curriculums in that particular area. For example, if we are talking about Lal Hira Pyakon, it will make more sense to include in Kirtipur because it is something that is associated with their local life and culture. Similarly, in Bhaktipur, Gintangisi might be more appropriate and Majipa Lake might be more suitable for Kathmandu and Gaon Pyakon in Lalitpur and such. And about in, um, involving the government, uh, so with this federal structure of Nepal, so municipalities are also the local governments, right? They have authority and they can implement the local curriculum in school levels. So um, it definitely needs to involve the government. When I say government, it's local government uh, for uh, implementing these courses. And again, whenever we implement uh, these various uh, cultural components in curriculum, uh, we do need to involve the community in all the decision making process and such. Um, I think uh, it's government involvement is pretty necessary and also that uh, the community decision about, uh, 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 you know, in decision making process is also necessary. Just a little bit follow up, if I'm not taking too much of time, because uh, I've just been recently for following on, uh, and my focus is I'm not an ethnomusicologist, so uh, I do come from a little bit different background, giving research and other ideas, social, social and cultural ideas to the students in uh, in the department. Uh, and my recent experiences with, uh, let's say, with few other communities in Nepal, so Nepal like the Chapang community or the Raute community, who have had a very different way of life, uh, hunting and gathering, uh, the last remaining hunting gathering people in Nepal. And uh, as we have seen over the years with the encroachment of urbanization and people and, uh, and the government with all its good intentions trying to help this uh, hunting and gathering people are actually trying to change their way of uh, life. And it just seems, and I think it just comes to a point where Pushpa was asking about where is the agency actually lying and who, who would be the better facilitators and moderators between these groups and this lack of understanding between the state and the government, such that as you can, as you said, would really facilitate in actually uh, preserving and conserving the traditions 
as the local people or the indigenous people actually do want it. Again, so when we talk about local culture, it, it's the people from that region and local government, you know, uh, the joint effort would be uh, the way to go. And uh, I think you also mentioned uh, about culture from different areas, how to include those in like broadly, just not limiting with one uh, particular uh, area. So, um, I can add one uh, of my experience, past experience, in developing a curriculum for the school level. Uh, so uh, that was the national curriculum and how we worked in uh, uh, including music in that curriculum was in the theory portion, we had uh, different culture and different uh, uh, music uh, traditions uh, in the theory portion, but in the, practic uh, the practical session, student can choose or the school can choose uh, based on the location, uh, what um, uh, practical, uh, you know, the music tradition they want to offer to the students. For example, uh, they can offer dhime or they, they can if, uh, include mado, uh, depending on like what geographical location they are and what is available and uh, in terms of uh, the people and resources. So that might also be the possibility for uh, including in curriculum in broader perspective and in different region. And again, with my final question, I just seem to have so many, so lots of questions because I found all, all, all these discussions very interesting. So uh, I think my final question is uh, on what's the threshold of something being just indigenous and then going into becoming a mainstream and commercial music? Uh, because as soon as uh, there is some exoticness that has always been attached and that has that does have a very colonial past one, how we call indigenous music, traditional music to the music of the world and the less developed world and the colonial powers and how we often do not do that in the more Western world and everything. So uh, when we do revitalize these kinds of uh, local traditions and everything, and we do push it for tourism, we want to, we want to bring the uh, economic conditions of the musicians higher and they do go beyond the local, they become global and everything. Uh, is there a fear that such popularity and going becoming a little bit mainstream would lose that aura of indigeneity and uh, uh, being something local or exotic in any sense? Or uh, is, is that just a fear that I, or people like me have and we just want to keep it just local and a little bit hidden and want some travelers coming over and trying to find these things and keeping that thing in mind. I'll actually speak to, to some of that. So I'd like to actually just um, respectfully challenge some of the language that you're using when it comes to words like preserve and conserve and like indigenous and that kind of thing. Because I think something that uh, we need to recognize about culture is that it, it, is not, it isn't static. It's yeah. always changing. And I think there's a danger in equating cultural change with cultural loss, because they're two very, very different things. Um, and so cultural change is actually a good thing because if we're going to keep a culture going, that's why I like the conversation that we've had about transmission here. It's about passing that on. Um, when you pass on a tradition, it's not necessarily going to be exactly the same as it was practiced in previous generations. And that doesn't necessarily mean that there's loss um, because, and this is where each generation actually needs to kind of figure out for themselves, what is this going to look like for us? How is this still benefiting us? Um, you know, what connection do we, do we have with that? And so when it comes to indigenous communities, and I think this is especially the case, at least in North America, is they'll actually assert, it's like, we're not just some product from the past. We're here in the present. Uh, we still have a very vibrant culture, even though it doesn't look the same as it did previously. So you can't talk about indigeneity as something that's a relic from the past that has to be preserved. Um, a lot of communities will actually, when it comes to their own culture, there are certain changes mm -hmm. that are happening because that's what they want. And so when it comes to um, you know, some of the things you were talking about, like commercialization or things like that, 
it really kind of comes down to who's making these decisions and why. Um, and is the, the community themselves involved? And this is where I would actually uh, recommend um, uh, Stephen Field's book, uh, Recasting Folk in the Himalayas. Um, so he actually talks about some of these drumming, traditional drumming traditions in Garhwal. Um, and one of the really interesting things that he talks about in that book is the music itself was actually upwardly mobile. It became part of a much wider uh, popular tradition um, but the practitioners themselves, because they were low caste, because they were from the margins of that community, were actually left behind. And so in that case, the music was mobile, but the people were not. And so um, in that case, it's just really interesting to see like where you had this music tradition that actually took root or uh, kind of took on a life of its own, but the original community it came from didn't benefit from it and um, they didn't necessarily have control over some of the things that happened to those traditions. And that's me generalizing it. Um, but again, kind of when we're thinking about culture, when we're thinking about some of these things, uh, we have to make sure that we're still working with people um, because even here, I mean, all of us on the panel, we're ethnomusicologists. And so, but again, the way that ethnomusicology is, we're yes, we're interested in the music we're really interested in the people who practice this music um, and kind of what it means to them. Uh, we're not always just interested in music as an art object in and of itself. So really kind of what do these um, traditions mean to a community and um, how are people using it for, for their, own, their own purposes? So those are just some things to think about when it comes to, instead of a language of like preservation and conservation and this idea of indigeneity as static, um, we need to understand that culture changes, indigenous communities are, they're here today, they're not a relic from the past, and really who is, um, who is making these decisions and why. So hopefully that, that was helpful in answering your question. Thank you very much. And thank you for, very much for correcting my language also. I totally agree with uh, what you say and uh, everything. And this is, these are some of the languages and, and things that uh, I do get from my own department as when I look at the department, my department's brochure, we, uh, there are words of preservation and conservation. And I do go out and have to teach my students about that culture is not static. It's always changing. and everything and more about archiving and all. So I really want to thank all of you for answering my questions. And uh, thank you again, Pushpa, for inviting me to, to this. It was really, uh, I found it very interesting. Thank you very much. Everybody. Can I just say how much I agree with uh, uh, Victoria's uh, uh, remarks there? I think that, that it is, uh, it, uh, hopefully the uh, communities from which we, uh, the communities that have actually preserved, in a sense, Dafa uh, over many uh, centuries, um, uh, should not lose out in the process of making this, uh, of, of moving on the tradition of, of the change and uh, so on that uh, Victoria has pointed to. Um, uh, I, but at the same time, uh, we should recognize that Dafa has changed um, and it, it was not always um, a, a tradition um, located in small neighborhoods in, in around town. Originally, it came from the palaces and uh, uh, greater temples of the uh, three cities of the Kathmandu Valley. Um, so it's already changed its, its location. Um, in a big way over time, um, and so we shouldn't be afraid of it changing uh, again. Um, but um, yeah, let's give all credit though, to those who currently uh, can teach us this art. We have uh, a few more questions for this. Um, this question, these questions come from Sriratta Manandar. Um, he was our keynote speaker for the um, opening ceremony, and uh, he asks, uh, how is Dafa Raga system related to Indian classical music? Uh, why is Dafa music so varied even within the colors of same locality, let alone different cities? So different in singing songs and playing instruments. I think Professor Vidas can answer to this question better. 
there is a relationship. There, many of the uh, ragas of Dafa have the same names as well-known ragas in uh, the Indian classical system or going back through the ages uh, to Sanskrit treatises of the last thousand or more years, uh, we find uh, many of these uh, raga names appearing there. Um, and then from the 17th century onwards, the, the tradition of raga mala, of raga paintings uh, came to Nepal and uh, a local tradition of that um, began and so on. So um, it, it, it's clear that um, I think we shouldn't talk about Nepal and India and uh, Pakistan and so on. We should think in terms of South Asia. Um, and uh, Dafa is one of an, a, a large number of traditions of religious music, re devotional singing um, that occur all over South Asia. Um, and they are all different, um, but they also have many characteristics in common, one of which is that melodies are, are ascribed to ragas. And out of all of that, um, the, what we call classical music um, uh, has, has sort of crystallized into a form that was cultivated in the, at the Mughal court and at Rajput courts of North India and also in South India. And um, so that became a, a very a specialized form of, of music. And exactly what the relationship of any one religious music tradition like Dafa is to that very specialized court music tradition is very complex. And we very often simply don't have the information on which to uh, uh, draw uh, specific conclusions. Um, but that there is a relationship is, is quite clear. He adds to that question, uh, who could be the original composers of Tafa music, Newars or some other stars? Why hasn't there been new compositions in the recent times? Mm. Is that for me as well? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, the the all the, most of the Dafa songs uh, in Bhaktapur anyway have the signature of um, rulers uh, of the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, occasionally, one or two from the 19th century as well, but uh, mainly uh, from the Malla period up to the mid 18th century. Um, how far that is is really uh, how how we are to understand that uh, is impossible to say. Did uh, Pratap Mala really compose um, that song that I sang at the at the beginning? We we simply don't know. Although uh, it's a very interesting song because it refers to um, the author himself, Pratap Mala, standing on the stage and saying to Shiva. Uh, make your entrance with your uh, with your gunner, um, uh, as though this is actually from a, a dramatic production. And we know that Pratap Mala and several of the other Mala rulers of the 17th and 18th centuries composed dramas, dance dramas. And I think that um, historically there's a close connection between Dafa and this dance drama. Uh, tradition. So maybe indeed um, some of the uh, or many of the Dafa songs really were composed by Pratap Mala or uh, Jagad Jyoti Mala or, or, or all these uh, various other rulers of the time. Uh, whether they also composed the music as well as the, uh, uh, the words, who knows, they would have had court musicians um, uh, and there would have been a Dafa group in each, uh, uh, for the Taleju temple of each of the three main cities. Um, so the expertise no doubt was there and um, uh, connected to that um, are the numerous treatises on music in Sanskrit uh, or Newari um, that, are, that are preserved in manuscript form in the uh, National Library in Kathmandu, again, attributed to rulers. I'm sure they must have got their court pundits to write them uh, for them. Um, but clearly the, the, there was expertise there uh, from which 
this repertoire ultimately originates. We have a few more questions. Uh, this is by Rabin Das Shrestazi. Uh, he asks, uh, this question is directed to Professor Vides. He asks, uh, Vides sir sees in his book that in order to understand what Raga means in the context of Dafa, we have to consider to what extent it resembles the concept of Raga in classical music of great tradition. Can you elaborate it? Um, I'm not sure that's exactly what I said, but as I as I said a moment ago, that there clearly is a connection. Um, uh, one one problem, of course, is that neither the Dafa uh, tradition nor the classical music tradition have remained static, um, so that maybe in say the 17th century. Uh, uh, raga Malar, for the sake of argument, in Dafa might have been the same Raga in, in musical melodic terms as uh, the Raga Malar that was being sung by Dansen in the Mughal court. Um, but both traditions have uh, changed in the meantime, and, uh, and neither the classical Malar today is the same as what Tansen sang, and nor is the, I'm sure, is that what might be sung as Malar in Dafa is, is, is its 17th century form. So um, without more uh, information, more data, it's very difficult to trace these changes and, uh, uh, and therefore to evaluate relationships. We have also been joined by Professor Ingmar Grandin, and uh, it's our honor, and we are very pleased to have him here, for sure. His uh, book itself, Music and Media in Local Life, uh, came out as a result, uh, I believe, of his engagement with musicians from Kirtipur. Um, so he poses a question um, directing to Professor Vidis. Uh, he says, as Professor Vidas has elaborated upon this, uh, upon in the session, the traditional way of teaching and learning Dafa has very much been a very efficient cultural machinery for safeguarding and reproducing Dafa as community music to ensure that young people in fact take part and do not leave until they have achieved a necessary level. Could you reflect upon what other ways there might be of such safeguarding in music schools, for instance? And another question, what happens then to Dafa as community music? Uh, Ingemar, it's after many years that we are meeting. Uh, I'm very happy to see you here. Um, namaste uh, to you, Richard. Yes. Namaste. <laughs> um, gosh, well, I feel we've, in a way, we've been discussing this question um, all uh, evening, um, and I'm not sure that I, how much more I can add to that discussion without repeating myself. Um, and I think also that these are these are this is a question that is going to be discussed at uh, even greater length in the uh, coming discussions. Um, um, so is there a more specific uh, aspect that you, you would like me to uh, focus on? Yes, perhaps. Yeah, what I was thinking about is that, I mean, once you leave this, um, this the, the community setting where Dafa has been uh, you know, propagated for so many years, and, and if you transfer it somewhere else, of course, you could find ways of safeguarding the music as music. I mean, uh, just look at the schools of music we have in, in, in Europe, for instance, where folk music traditions are taken up and you get certified, just like at the pujas you will, uh, or in the rituals, you will get certified that you have achieved this level or you can play the violin in this level and so on. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you also said, and that was what provoked my question, uh, that the communities that have preserved this music should not lose out. And I think, mm. is that possible? That must be the, the question uh, at heart of my yeah, yeah. <laughs> comment. Uh, I, yes, I, I just don't know. Um, though perhaps an encouraging thought 
is that I know that, um, well, it, and not just in Nepal, but in many uh, societies, um, traditions um, begin to fade out um, until somebody comes and takes an interest. And the effect of that can be to re-stimulate local pride and local interest in their own traditions. I mean, this is a universal and happens so often. So I feel that what we're doing here and now, hopefully, uh, might be the beginning of a process that um, stimulates local local pride, um, and and uh, therefore will mean that Darfa is not simply wrenched out of its current uh, social context, but but also is re-stimulated in that context. I hope that's not too optimistic. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Professor Woodis on that. Uh, it's, uh, you know, these new platforms, whether that be uh, introduc introducing this as a course in school or performing in different setting, this could be, um, you know, uh, used as a strategy to promote the music and raise the awareness and our focus uh, should be uh, preserving it in traditional setting as well. And, you know, all these new things could be additional to that, but not, uh, should not come as replacement. To kind of go off of that, especially since, um, again, the university setting has been mentioned, um, I think this is where like the university itself would need to kind of rethink what they, um, what they consider qualifications to teach at the university level. So, I mean, for example, in the United States, I mean, especially if you're in an R1 institute, you're looking for a full-time position, it's kind of a given that you're going to have a PhD. That might not be as helpful for a place like Nepal, especially if you're talking about, you know, traditional uh, music practices. And this is actually one thing that I've um, been impressed with when I have been at Kathmandu University is a number of the instructors actually are from local communities, especially when it comes to um, like practical music and the ensembles that they have there. And so for a lot of those instructors kind of teaching at the university has been an extension of what they're already doing in their communities. And again, uh, some of, the, of the, uh, those instructors have actually gone on to get their BA in music uh, from Kathmandu University, uh, but they were still instructors there long before that. And so, I mean, in that case, um, kind of thinking about you know, who, who is qualified to teach at a tertiary level, um, especially for a place like Nepal, if you're going to start incorporating these traditions into a higher ed setting or even into a, uh, like a secondary or primary school setting, um, kind of rethinking, you know, what kinds of qualifications are actually necessary. Um, they might not necessarily need to have, um, you know, pass their SLC themselves in that case in order to actually teach in, um, in a public school setting. So kind of rethinking there, you know, what, what qualifies someone to teach in these settings. So, well, thank you everyone very much. Um, here we come to the end of our first panel session. And uh, uh, I believe we had uh, such a wonderful conversation and uh, we came into uh, the discussion of, uh, um, of one one particular question, who has the answer? And uh, seems like uh, it is uh, a very subjective question and uh, we, we are to see who has the answer. And um, um, so I would like to extend my thanks once again to our panelists, Professor Vides, uh, Professor Prasapati and Professor Turi. Um, and everyone, uh, including uh, my own mentor from uh, Kathmandu University, Ishan Gimirishar, uh, Ingmar Grindin, um, Professor Ingmar Grindin, and uh, Sriratna Manandar, and uh, Rabin Das Shrestazi for passing on their questions, and everybody else present in the audience for uh, attending this session. Once again, thank you, everyone. Um, here, we will end the, this Zoom meeting, and uh, we hope to see you in um, other panel sessions as well. Uh, once again, thanking our um, panelists for 
uh, accepting our invitation and uh, giving their valuable time um, and uh, giving us new perspectives on viewing the past, present, and future of Dafa tradition. Thank you. And thank you, thank Pushpa, you. for putting this together. This has been really pleasant. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. That's been a real pleasure.